remember our conversation on public speaking. Most of us are wired to hate the process. Well, today we want to go a step further than simply establishing that very fact and help our listeners tackle what feels like a pretty natural fear. We got the expert on thinking fast and talking smart, which happens to be the name of his podcast. We're joined by Matt Abrams, a lecturer in a strategic communication at Stanford's Graduate School of Business and a speech guru who is already YouTube famous. Thanks for joining us on the program, Matt. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited for our conversation. Uh, for, for full disclosure, Matt was my English teacher two decades ago. <laughs> All right. Can you believe it? It's amazing. I think it's mind-blowing and slightly disturbing how quickly time just slips by. <laughs> yeah, well, just think about how I feel. <laughs> All right. Uh, I think, Matt, it's really appropriate we preface this conversation by stating that an overwhelming majority of people in Korea, in the U.S., fear or hate public speaking. Yet, you put this great deal of emphasis on reframing how we view public speaking. So how do we go about embracing anxiety when, in fact, it sounds dreadful and all I want to do is crumble at the fear? <laughs> well, you are not alone. And, and it's not just in the U.S. and Korea. It is everywhere. Uh, those of us who study anxiety around speaking believe it's in our biology. And so that's not to say we can't do something about it. And in fact, we certainly can. And part of it is embracing it and acknowledging that it's normal and natural to be nervous in these situations. We're doing something that's important. We're doing something that has value to us and the people we're talking to. So we have to recognize that one of the taxes, if you will, that we have to pay to communicate, to share our ideas, to connect with others is in some cases anxiety. So part of it is acknowledging it. The other part is just adjusting your mindset and saying this tension I feel, the, 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 this physical sensation that I feel, could also be excitement. You know, I'm, I'm excited about what I'm saying. I'm excited at the opportunity that this might afford me. And simply reframing the physiological responses as excitement can help people as well. So you know, a lot of it has to do with mindset and, and recognizing that this is normal and natural. I'm kind of stuck on the way you just compared uh, public speaking to paying taxes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I said it's the tax we pay uh, in order to do in order to do things just like the taxes we pay to be part of a society. A, a small price to pay to reap the benefits. I understand. I, I think on the note of reframing our perspective, which seems to be the most important pi uh, part of uh, overcoming our fears of public speaking, one of your recommendations was uh, to dare to be dull. And frankly speaking, as someone who goes live on radio every morning, that's a paralyzing thought to be dull. You say in several <laughs> of your uh, lectures, rather than striving for greatness, it dare to be dull. Can you elaborate? Because it's puzzling. Uh, it, it certainly does sound puzzling. And I have the audacity to get up in front of Stanford MBA students, some of the brightest business minds in the world and, and say exactly that, strive for mediocrity, dare to be dull. This is an idea that comes from the world of improvisation. And it's really based on a, a fundamental neuroscience principle. When you are putting pressure on yourself to do it perfectly, to do it right, whatever that it is, communication, athletic performance, music performance, you actually reduce the likelihood that you will do it well because you are focusing so much on judging and evaluating what you're doing in the moment. It all comes down to what's known as cognitive resource theory. You only have so many resources that you can dedicate to whatever you're doing. Hmm. And if part of your brain is focused on judging, evaluating, comparing, that means only part of your brain is available to do what it is you're trying to do. So the concept of dare to be dull is to remove that pressure of hmm. doing it right. Just get it done. And by doing so, you actually free up those resources so you can actually achieve what you wish. So I often say the second part of dare to be dull or strive for mediocrity is so that you can achieve greatness. <laughs> and again, when you focus on just doing what you're doing, just getting it done, that means you have more effort that you can focus on doing it well. So I know it's weird. I know it sounds strange, but it's absolutely liberating. And the last thing I'll say 
There is no right way to communicate. We put so much pressure on ourselves to do it right. Mm -hmm. There is no right way. There are better ways and worse ways, Mm -hmm. but there is no right way. So if you accept that and dare to be dull, you can actually reduce a tremendous amount of pressure you put on yourself. Matt, if you look at the comments that has amounted to hundreds, if not thousands, on your past TED Talks and lectures you gave at Stanford, people say they revisit your lecture for what seems to be a pep talk, a reminder to reframe uh, (laughs) our thoughts. And I might need that now every day before I go live on my radio show. (laughs) (laughs) I've heard what you do, and you do a great job. Uh, I'm not sure you need a pep talk. Uh, I was fishing for it, and thank you very much. Uh, You know, I I got thinking because charismatic speakers also do fumble through their sentences. Do you think it's okay or maybe even expected for us to fumble and mess up mid-sentence, mispronounce words and still somehow power through? Absolutely. And in fact, that's that's normal and typical. You know, playwrights and screenwriters, they actually build in those fumbles and disfluencies to make it sound real. The people who are polished and make no mistakes, they sound inauthentic. And and I think, you know, I love TED Talks. I think TED Talks are phenomenal. I have done a few. I've definitely coached lots of TED speakers. But the reality is there's a slight disservice that TED does in that when we watch people speak, we think, oh, my goodness, that's what good speaking is. Mm. Flawless, perfect speaking. The reality is two things. One, those people practice a lot. And I can tell you because I've been part of those practices. (laughs) But also, sometimes TED Talks are even edited. So they take out some of the errors and mistakes. So it is perfectly normal and natural to have disfluencies and have uh, restarts. And the reality is this. We put, we see ourselves and evaluate ourselves much more harshly than the people around us do. And it's actually, there's a phenomenon in psychology called the spotlight effect, Hmm. meaning we shine the spotlight brighter on ourselves than anybody else. So we are focused on every little mistake we make. And the reality is most people don't see those mistakes. (laughs) And I'm the only one that remembers. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Can you give my listeners some of your most prized practical tips on how to become a more memorable speaker? Of course, we gave all the references to your podcast. That might be a good way to keep up. But just for those who are tuning in right now, some of the obvious tricks of the trades that I think we are inclined to resort to seem dangerous. Like, for example, humor, which you do a great deal of including in your lectures and even in today's conversation. But it seems to be an engaging but sometimes risky tool. So what are some of the better ways to keep our audience's attention without maybe losing credibility or losing worse the audience's attention altogether well i want to record just what you said that you think i'm funny which is great because not everybody does so thank you for that compliment and you're right humor is a very effective way to connect and engage your audience but it is also very risky because a joke that does not go over well sets you back farther than one that plays well There are other ways to engage your audience. And let me be very clear what I mean by engagement. Engagement to me is sustained attention. The most precious commodity we have in the world today, I believe, is attention. If people aren't focused on what we're saying, they are distracted. So we want to get their attention and sustain it. And there are a few ways of doing this. In fact, I divide them into three categories. There's physical engagement. Get people doing something. Maybe you take a poll where somebody has to raise their hand. Maybe if you're virtual, people are typing in the chat or using a shared whiteboard or watching a video together. Mm. Do something where people are physically engaged. When they're doing something physically, their brains will follow and they'll be engaged and paying attention. Second is to get people engaged mentally. You do that by asking questions. You're an expert at asking questions. (laughs) Using analogies and comparisons. If you can compare something like we talked about earlier, we talked about anxiety of attacks. That's a comparison. It gets people thinking and engaged. And then finally, use language. The most powerful word you can use to engage people is the word you. When I say things like, as you know, or as you might be wondering, you pay attention more. Mm -hmm. You can also use time-traveling language. Take people into the future. Imagine what it would be like. Mm -hmm. What if you could? Picture this. That language takes people into the future. They're engaged. They're thinking about it. Similarly, you can take people into the past. Remember when. Think back to when. So we can engage people, not just through humor, but we can engage them physically. 
mentally and linguistically. So those are the tools, the little tricks that people use. And I, and I would challenge any of your listeners, if there is a communicator you think is really good and really engaging, you will see them using those techniques I just talked about. That's the secret sauce of engagement. <laughs> you gave away the secret sauce. Uh, thank you. I for just that. did. <laughs> Imagine not being afraid of speaking in front of hundreds of people. Mm. <laughs> yeah, think about that. What would that be like if you could do that? Uh, it would require actually a lot of practice, but eventually I think overcoming it would be of great service to myself more than anything else. I, I do think I want to get a little bit specific for my next question. In the South Korean cultural context, and maybe so for some of our neighboring countries, the appearance of humility is sort of the expected norm. Are the communication skills you teach universal mostly, or, or do you believe there to be some caveats? Well, the absolute culture plays a very important role in communication. And culture, not just by place of origin or location on a map. Culture can mean lots of things within an organization. Organizations have cultures. What one company does versus another, very different culture. Within families, you know, when, when I'm married into my wife's family, they have a very different culture than mine. In my family, I grew up, the only way to be heard was whoever spoke louder and longest. In my wife's family, they actually listen to each other. So different cultures definitely impact how we communicate, what's expected. And one of the biggest challenges in a global economy is for people to understand that they have to adjust their content and the way in which they speak, depending on the culture. Again, place of origin, country, could be company. And this notion of humility is really important. And, and many people miss that when they deal with people from different cultures. And there's some things you can do to express that humility. Mm -hmm. Paraphrasing, listening, pausing, all of that can help convey the respect that's expected in, in some cultures. So culture is absolutely critical. We have to pay attention to it. And, and culture and communication are intimately connected. I've actually learned in uh, daily conversations, sometimes tough interviews, that taking a bead can also be a powerful tool, especially on a live show when you seem to be losing pace or you want to give the interviewee some time to reflect on their thoughts, even if it's just 10 seconds more. Is there an effective way to maybe utilize pauses, strategic silences in between your speech as well? I mean, you mentioned the notion of authenticity. Can this also come off as more authentic? Absolutely. I mean, in most conversations, people pause, people think, people repeat themselves. These are, these are normal steps. Mm -hmm. We feel, and especially in, in a profession like yours where, where you're on the spot, uh, literally, we feel this urge to fill the air, to fill the space. But a lot of communication happens in silence. You know, if somebody says something that's really poignant or powerful, taking that pause before you respond says something, right? It says you're thinking about it or you're impacted by it. So inviting a pause, taking a pause can be helpful. One of the most useful tools I've learned as somebody who, who has the opportunity to question people as a host on my podcast mm. is pausing after somebody responds to a question I ask, giving them permission almost to say more. And some of the most insightful things I've learned in conversations, be it on my podcast or in my interpersonal life, is what happens in the pause after somebody stop, stops talking. It's, it's actually a gift to give them more time to speak. So I think it's not only more authentic, it's actually more effective if mm. we take time to pause. It might be helpful if I had a visual on you because we do gain a great deal of knowledge from our, our facial expressions, our hand gestures, where our mm -hmm. eyes go. And those are the cues I'm missing this morning, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> Well, nobody's missing anything by not seeing what I look like, believe me. <laughs> but, but you're right. I mean, the nonverbal presence yeah. is important. And, uh, you know, we learned during the pandemic when we weren't physically with people or we had masks on just how critical it is. And, and we have to pay attention. There's some good research that says how you say something is, is as important, in some cases more important, than what it is you say. So paying attention to nonverbals is really, really important. Uh, I do wonder, have you ever taught grad school students or executives that learned English as their second language? Because we do have a lot of international listeners who might speak a few other languages, and maybe English was our second or third. Uh, what kind of advice would you give to someone who has to speak in their non-native tongue to give an important speech? 
so to answer the first part of your question, absolutely. Everywhere I teach, uh, I am teaching non-native uh, English speakers. And, and second, I have to say that I am in absolute awe of people who speak in multiple languages. I, I struggle with English, and that's my native tongue. Uh, two bits of advice I'll give. One is mine, and one comes from somebody I interviewed on my podcast. So the advice I have is it's important when you communicate, especially if you're communicating in a language that is not your native language, to repeat yourself, but not repeat yourself in a way where you just say the same thing right after you just said it. Use examples, tell stories that repeat or reflect what you, you said before to help people understand it the second time or third time if they don't get it the first time. So make it easier for your audience. So you might say something and then repeat yourself through an example or through a story that you tell. Mm -hmm. That helps your audience and it helps you feel more comfortable. My, my non-native speaking students or co people I coach often tell me they're more nervous because they're worried that they're not getting their point across or they're not saying it the right way, whatever the right way is. Mm -hmm. So this repetition through story, through example, gives you a second or third try at getting the point across, and that reduces anxiety. Mm. Now, the advice I learned from somebody I interviewed on my podcast, his name is Ken Romeo. He, he teaches non-native speakers, in this case, non-native uh, English speakers. And he said the number one thing that he has found that helps the people he teaches and coaches is to make the point that the goal is not to sound like a native speaker. Mm. The goal is to communicate your point and get your ideas across. You'll never be a native speaker of another language that, by definition. So mm -hmm. putting that pressure on yourself to sound like a native speaker is not ever going to be something that's realized. Rather, focus your efforts on communicating clearly your ideas. Mm -hmm. And I have seen that advice really help non-native speakers feel better about it. So it's, what's the right focus? The focus is getting your message across. Let's say I have an important presentation coming up tomorrow, a speech to give, a broadcast to go uh, live on. What is my best game plan the night before and the morning of? Uh, I think you should prepare for a presentation or some significant speaking event, uh, just like you would prepare if you were an athlete. Uh, you should eat well, you should sleep well, you should exercise. This, I call this communication hygiene. You need, to, you need to do things well to support your body and your mind. Staying up all night, drinking caffeine, uh, worrying and stressing about it, it's only going to work against you. Tremendous amount of research that says that. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of how to prepare yourself, first and foremost, really think about what is your goal for that communication event. And to me, a goal has three parts. No, feel, do. What do I want my audience to know? How do I want them to feel? And what do I want them to do as a result? Mm -hmm. Starting there will help you tailor and focus your message so it keeps you focused. When you're about to speak, Remind yourself that you have value to bring, that, this, uh, that your audience has something to gain from hearing you speak. Mm -hmm. That gets you focused, it reminds you of your goal, and it takes the pressure and attention off of you and puts it on the audience. That is, my goal is the audience, not how I do. And then finally, take some deep belly breaths right before you go. If you've ever done yoga or tai chi or some kind of deep breathing meditative practice, the deep breaths will calm you down and will help you focus on what you're doing. So those would be the three things that I would do in addition to the eating well, exercising, and getting a good night's rest. And I kind of love, though, the naming you gave it, communication hygiene. I guess, I mean, we get dressed up in the morning, we brush our teeth, we drink water. But I, I mean, I guess it goes a few steps further than that, including but not limited to those meditative breaths. Yeah. I, I do it every morning. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and that's probably what serves you well. Right. So so thinking about it that way, again, the analogy to an athlete is, yeah. is, is a really good one. You know, if you're an athlete, you know, sleeping well, taking care of your body is important. Yeah. Same thing when you speak. And listening to your perhaps your body's cues, get a good night's rest. Um, yeah. Our team is all deprived of rest, but we're trying. Believe me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, Matt. That was such an insightful conversation. More than anything, I do hope our listeners feel more confident the next time they have to speak in front of dozens, if not hundreds of people. I do want to let our listeners know you can find more of Matt Abrams' uh, words of wisdom on his podcast, Thinking Fast, Talking Smart. Thank you so much, Matt. Thank you for the opportunity.